to the Virtual Medical Educators Forum. I'm Jen. Today I'm going to talk to you about Huntington's disease. Now this is a condition that a lot of doctors are afraid to talk about with their patients, mainly because of the progression of the disease and ultimately we know how it's going to impact our patients' lives. Therefore it's something that we're scared to talk about, worried to talk about and actually sometimes we don't know how to tell them about it. So hopefully today we can talk about the condition, how we tell our patients and how to address our patients' concerns. Because of the difficult nature of the condition, it often comes up in Royal College exams to explain this to a patient and address their concerns. So at the end, we'll also talk about tips and hints on how to approach it in an exam situation. So firstly, about the condition itself. Huntington's disease can also be called Huntington's career because of the classic repetitive motor movements that patients tend to get that we see. Now Huntington's is a genetic disorder, meaning it's inherited. The genetic mutation in particular is a CAG trinucleotide repeat disorder, that's CAG triplet that's repeated in the genome sequence. Usually it's picked up through genetic testing and usually it's sent off whenever people have symptoms suggestive of the disease or have got family members of that have got the condition already. Because of the type of mutation it has, it has an extra phenomena called anticipation, meaning patients as each generation is passed on will develop symptoms or have the manifestations come up earlier in life. So they'd be younger, each time they have further children, their children will suffer at a younger age. In regards to patients, how do we explain this to patients? Now, it's a very difficult disorder, how to explain it to patients, in which case the most important thing is actually to explain in a very common term, no jargon fashion jargon meaning no medical terms or scientific terms that's just going to be overwhelming for the patient to understand because remember they're trying to understand a condition that is going to be for them with them for the rest of their lives so the way I normally approach it to a patient is to explain that touch base with the patient and get them to really talk about the symptoms that they're having at the moment and why they got the testing in the first place this allows you time to understand what they're worried about Build a rapport with the patient before you break the bad news. Once they have finished talking about their symptoms, just say, I've got your test results, and unfortunately, it has come back positive for Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is a genetic disease, meaning it's something that is majority of the time inherited, in which case, it's something that you were born with. It's a neurological condition that affects the nerves in your brain and the rest of your body. This means it can affect the way that you think, feel and what you can do. By saying that you can link it up with the symptoms that they mentioned earlier and that means that you're personalising and individualising the diagnosis to them. You can explain that it can be passed on to children and you can explain the anticipation phenomena. In these situations, the patients don't really need to understand which genetic mutation has caused the condition at all. They're more concerned about how it's going to affect them and what it means for them in their lives. In which case, the most important thing is how to address each person's concerns in particular for them. So. The most common things that people tend to bring up are things about, are they going to die? Am I going to pass it on to my children? How am I going to manage this? And what am I, what's going to happen to me ultimately? Now, in the terms of the question that no one likes to hear and get asked is, am I going to die? The best way to approach it is just to be honest with the patient and explain this is a progressive disorder. Unfortunately, that means that the symptoms that you have will get worse. It's important that you explain that the patients don't die from the disorder, but what they usually do is they die from the complications of the disorder as it progresses into the end stage phase. This may mean that if they have swallowing problems, they may 
get, they may aspirate and die from aspiration pneumonia. If they get end stage to the point where they can't move or they're bed bound, it may be that they die from other frailty conditions or from recurrent infections or um, the inability to eat and drink. In regards to the movement, you can say how it's going to affect them. So most of the time they're worried about the tremors and how it affects their life, especially if they're in their job on manual labourers and how it will affect them. The most important thing to tell them is, unfortunately, these movement disorders will get worse and it's how to plan for the future. At least by giving them the diagnosis, they can plan ahead to figure out how they're going to work, how they're going to get enough money and how it's going to affect their family. You have to warn them that the symptoms will get worse. This ultimately may mean that they can't walk, can't eat, may not be able to drink properly, or they may not be able to do intricate details with their hands anymore. So for people who are, say for instance, musicians or pianists, the intricate fine movements and hands are really important. And this is a big impact to their living and their lives. And in which case, all you can do is just listen to them and listen to their concerns and remind them that even though it's something that they may not be able to do in the future, it's how they can adjust it for the future so that they can do it for as long as possible. Other things that patients get concerned about are their children. Now, as any parent would argue, their children are the most important thing to them. So the fear of passing on this chronic illness to their children is a big impact. In which case, listen to them, listen to the concerns that they have and explain to them it is inherited most of the time, in which case the likelihood is half of their children may have inherited the disorder. Because of the nature of the condition, they may note the signs and symptoms at a younger age compared to you. They often ask at the same time as, well, can I get my children tested for it? And the most important thing to say is, until they're 18, they can't be forced to have genetic testing because of the emotional impact that they have on that child. It doesn't matter if they've got parental legal responsibility over the child, they can't force them to have it. Once they're 18, the child can decide for themselves whether or not they get tested. The parent can't take the responsibility of the emotional and psychological impact on that child at such a young age, which is why we don't offer legal testing at this point. That's how you explain it to the patient and just apologise that there's nothing that, that they can do, but it's about how they're actually going to explain it to their children, in which case you point them out to services and support services or patients' websites which give advice on how to tell their children because it's a very big condition to tell them and they want to come across correctly that they don't scare their children but give them enough warning that their parents are sick. What often next comes in the conversation is, well, okay, you've told me I've got this condition, but what's going to happen to me? It's important that you point out all three types of symptoms that you have. So motor skills, which affect walking, hand movements, how that impacts on their job, and how it's important that they let their job know so that occupational health can get involved and they can plan for the future. In regards to cognitive impairment, the best way of describing it is you may have lose the ability to remember things, the ability to do complex thinking, in which case it's very similar to the condition Alzheimer's, in which case they have something that they can compare it to and help them understand how it will impact them in the end. The way you describe it is it's very similar to Alzheimer's in that respect, but it affects you at a younger age. You also mentioned the fact that if they've got the tremor, there are some medications that may slow down the tremor, but doesn't cure it. Usually, a lot of people complain about the guilt and the shame that they may have. All you can do is give them the reassurance that it's nothing that they've done wrong that I've given them the condition. There's no point blaming their parents and there's no point in feeling guilt and passing it to their children. Unfortunately, it's in their genes. It's something that they pass on. It was nothing that they can control in the first place. You just try to be as sympathetic and empathic as possible and you just listen to their concerns and you give them the reassurance that it's never their fault, it's something that's happened and now it's time to address it and our job as doctors and healthcare providers is to support them through this. 
Now, for the exam situation, most of the time the scenarios are written so that the patients have their own problems that they want to come across. And your job as the doctor is really to give them time to express this. In regards to the actual explanation of the diagnosis, just do what I've just done in this video. Keep it simple, keep it medical jargon free, and try and use the technique of chunk and check. Give them small bits of information, give them time to assimilate before you give them any more information. If you want more advice about that technique, see our other video about breaking bad news. Now about addressing patient concerns, you can be as really simple and just ask them, is there anything in particular you're worried about or anything you're concerned about? If they haven't come across with anything, you can just prompt them to go, do you have any family? Are you worried about your children? Because you can offer support services through support nurses, charities and other specialists in the field. The most important thing is, is that you listen to the patient, and give them time to express themselves and time to assimilate the information you've given them and also time to process the emotional impact that you've given them. Allowing big pauses for them to do this is important. Having a silence in your consultation is not a bad thing, sometimes it's actually a good thing. It means that you're allowing time for the patient, for themselves, you're not being overly pushy, and sometimes if the pause is long enough, the patient will prompt themselves when they want another information chunk, or if they've got a question of their own. So don't be afraid to just wait. And if you think you've waited long enough, you probably haven't, in which case wait another five, 10 seconds, and they'll actually give you a bit more information and actually help you as the candidate. I hope this video has been helpful. If you've got any questions, or if you want a bit more information about the condition, leave a comment and we'll see if we can get back to you. Thank you.